Okay, hey, welcome. This is the second part of our deer tanning process. Where in the first one, what we did was to flesh the hide on the beam and we got it put into our rack. And now what we're gonna be doing, because this one I'll probably make into some buckskin, is we're gonna remove the hair. There's a couple of ways you can do this. There's a wet scrape method and there's a dry scrape method. I've used both. I actually just prefer the dry scrape method. And I like it because I can, I can really control my thickness where I'm wanting to get down if I need to thin some areas and really see how that hide is kind of looking. Um, we don't have a lot of sun today, but we'll see after a while. We'll do some close-ups where um, you can see your You've got a really good skin that will break pretty easily when you can see your fingers through the back of it there. Now with some of the some of the bigger bucks it's kind of hard to see that but that's when it's nice to have a scraper where you can, you can get that 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 hide thin down to a good weight. There's only three tools that I'm going to be using while we when I scrape this hide today. First of that first of those is a pair of these little scissors. You can pick these up they actually sold scissors like this during the fur trade era. Uh, they were imported, uh, so are these. The other is this tool right here. And this is made from part of an elk antler. And then it's got a pretty sharp blade. I'll turn it here a little bit. This is a blade that was made for me. Uh, I've got three of these. These were made by Neil Kindell out of Wells, Kansas. I use all three, but this one, for some reason, this one in particular, I, I really like uh, the shape of it and the way this feels in my hand and how it's working on the hide. The only other thing I'm gonna use is just my butcher knife. I've made a little bit of a start on this right now and I wanted to go ahead and, and, and get some of this done before I actually started talking about what process I use on this. One of the first things that I do when I, when I get my hide up and it's all dried, I want to try and save as much of this hide as I can. So, in places where I know there's a possibility that when I'm using my wahinke to, to, to scrape this, that I might hit those strings. I like to take these little scissors, if I can get in there and really trim some of that hair. It makes it a lot easier when I'm working with the scraper. Okay, so let's, let's do a little work on this area. Just, I guess you can just kind of watch how I'm, how I'm using the wahinki and, and using that as I kind of make my area. You can almost see sort of the pressure. That's what's kind of hard about film. Unless you're doing it, you have to kind of get a feel for when you're getting down into the hide and down through that layer that you want to get to. All right, this is a good this is a good spot to maybe talk about too so i'm over near the edge and obviously the, the hide gets pretty thin on the edge so you want to take your time remember you don't have to be in a hurry to do this As you work towards that edge, and you'll you'll kind of feel how hard you can press without really tearing that. You can see that's that's pretty translucent, and it looks it looks pretty thin, but that's going to be a nice piece of the hide right there. So I have my sort of blocked area here, and now now I'm just going to work this um, and get the hair off here. As 
little hole there. You want to be careful of those. It looks like there's that hair. It's something you could get off, but that's a little pinhole and it's still got a little hair. I'm just going to leave that. Just kind of work around it. Because as I break that, that hair's going to come off there anyway. another good spot I showed you the here's my exit hole I kind of trimmed around that now I'm seeing some some blood on this side so now what I'm gonna do I'm just gonna reach around on the other side of that and make sure that's either not a hole or that's just maybe where Blad out on the hide a little bit, and I don't feel that hole there. I'm gonna peek. It is there, but it's a little lower. It's right here, okay? But, the worst thing you, worst thing to do is to really get, you get, get a nice hide. You've only got a couple holes that you'll be able to stitch up. And you hit that with your wahinky that's the really pretty sharp. And man, you can just you can just tear it. it just your stomach will just drop. Okay, so I've got this area kind of cleaned up. Typically, typically I'm using I'm using a kind of a vertical stroke. But every hide's different. You're gonna have to just sort of learn the hide. And one thing that I would say be careful of, especially on, on deer, get over here. This is kind of on the underbelly of that deer. You see that really hit, that nice white hair. Sometimes when you're using a scraper on that area there, you kind of you can kind of see that it doesn't wanna doesn't want to come off like the other hair. And even there, you see I've got a piece that's kind of stuck to my to my scraper. Be careful of, of that because what might happen is you're gonna to wanna to, you're gonna to wanna to push too hard and it's gonna gum up on that scraper and you can poke a hole through there. So this is an area that I'll probably come back. I'll just just really take my time on this area because I don't want to put a hole in it. But I've got, to, I've got to clean that scraper off every couple of strokes because that hair is so fine and it will build up instead of what you find when you're scraping with off that, that longer deer hair. And one other thing, of course, most of us know deer hair is hollow. It's kind of interesting that that's what keeps the deer insulated. And I typically will fill up a, a couple of grocery bags of deer hair, because I have some friends who love to fly fish. And this, this hair is just perfect for some of the, some of the flies and the lures that, that, those, uh, that those people like to tie. So even that shouldn't go to waste. In fact, the natives use that, and stick that in their moccasins to keep their feet warm. One thing you'll notice, and I talked about this during the fleshing process, I don't like ticks. <laughs> if you had your hides in the freezer before you flush them, 
and then you dry rack and start scraping your hair. Um, you'll be surprised at just how many ticks are on a deer. Of course, it depends a lot. I mean, not every deer is the same, but, and, and it, it, a lot depends on where, you know, where they, where they forage, where they live. But uh, boy, I tell you, every time I do this, it's, I bet I find no less than probably a hundred ticks. Good thing they're dead though. All right, so other than a few areas uh, along the edges, which I'm gonna, I'm just gonna clean up. I've probably been on this hide now, oh, a little over an hour. Again, I'm not trying to rush. I'm gonna take my time because I want, a, I want a nice hide when I'm done. So at this point, what I'll do is, once I get these edges kind of cleaned up, we'll take it out of the rack. We'll get it in the tanning solution. All right, so here's our hide. Kind of trimmed off those areas that I know I'm not going to use. My two holes. And I did lie a little bit. One other thing that I do before I'm going to put it in the tanning solution, I have both a couple of pumice rocks, but these all sanding pads that uh, you can buy, you know, Ace Hardware, Lowe's, Home Depot. These come in nice and handy. You can go just kind of go over your hide. If there's any rust spots, it also kind of cleans it up. Get some of that. If there's any of that hair left on them. That's a hole I put in from miss scraping. But we're ready. We're ready now to put this in the tanning solution. And I'll show you that recipe in just a little bit. Now we're back in the shop to mix up our tanning solution and get our hide into that solution. And we're gonna let it set for, oh, I don't know. I'll probably check it in an hour. In another hour, I'll, I'll probably do some more work on it. And then in the next video, we'll talk about softening the hide. Let's talk a little bit about the tanning process. When you're tanning a hide, what you're literally doing is, is taking out a lot of the proteins and the fats that are in the hide when you both flush it and then you dehair it. If you get it wet and you try and soften it, it's, it's not gonna soften. It's just going to be a, a piece of raw hide really hard. And that's good for some things. But if you're going to want to make any kind of clothing uh, or some bags or footwear, you want that to be softened up. There's a number of ways to do it. I'm gonna show you the way I do it, but let's talk a little bit about some of the traditional methods. As the saying goes, every critter on this earth has enough brains in its head to tan its hide. I'm not so sure if that's true in my case, but it is true that uh, a lot of the native tribes, when they were either tanning buffalo or tanning deer, uh, saved as much of the animal as possible. And they did utilize the brains for uh, the tanning process. And of course, the brain is full of a lot of those proteins uh, and those aminos that are very, very important to getting the, uh, the right chemicals back into the hide to keep those suspended in there so that you can soften it up. Today, a lot of hunters won't, they don't keep a lot of the, uh, the deer or uh, the buffalo. So it's sometimes hard to get brains unless you know what you're doing. Probably if you're wanting to brain tan, one of the easiest ways to do that is find, find your local meat market or any processors that might be in your area. You can, you can find uh, deer brains. If, if, they, if they save those for you, you can have that done. Typically, if I've used brains, what I like to use are pork brains because they're pretty readily available. You can check with a butcher, uh, ask them if they're going to be getting some in or you can order some in. They're not very expensive. You can freeze them and then when you're ready to go, you just let them thaw and you can mix that up. One caution with brains, and I, I would encourage you to do this, uh, wear gloves. Always, it's always good to be safe when you're, when you're messing with, with, uh, with brains. My good friend, Ron Nail, uh, when he uses brains on his hide, you need to watch one of his videos where he talks about, I think he uses pork brains. Make sure guys, if you're going to uh, mix those up, 
in, uh, in a blender. You're not using your favorite blender that you might mix up a margarita in. You can find blenders cheap down at a thrift store, and that's one way to, to mix up the brain solution. Another way is, is, just, to, is just to mash it up. Uh, I've done brains, and, and they're very, very, they, they work well. They've worked for hundreds of years. Another method that you can use, of course, uh, are eggs. A lot, of, uh, a lot of people use just egg yolks. The method I prefer is a, an alternative to both brains and, and eggs. It's not a new recipe or something unique to me. And a lot of the research that I've done, and you can find this recipe in, in some of the books that I've got down in the description below. It's just a few items uh, that help put that tanning process together so that, and I have a good friend who's a chemist who can explain all of this much more eloquently than I, but basically you're putting, putting back uh, into the hide some proteins and some oils to sort of hold them in suspension there to keep that hide soft and supple. So, along with the soy lecithin, and there's a lot of alternatives out there. This is a great company that I've been getting some of the soy lecithin from. The only other items that I make use of are some ivory soap, and pure neat's foot oil. And I'll emphasize that again, pure neat's foot oil. Don't, don't get the, the neat's foot oil compound. It's got some petroleum products in that and you don't want that in your hide. My, uh, my measurements for this, for an average size hide, eight to 12 square feet, I'm probably going to use close to a gallon of water. And interestingly enough, if you, uh, if you have access to where you have soft water, that's, that's even better. Uh, I don't use my well water because it, it's hard. So I use my city water, which is, well, it's not as hard, but about a gallon of water. And then I take my bar of ivory soap and I have an old cheese grater. I usually grate up, oh, maybe about a third of this bar. And then I take maybe a quarter cup of pure neat soot oil. And I let that start simmering in, in my pot. Be careful, quick quiz. Everybody knows water boils at what temperature? Yes, 212 degrees Fahrenheit. But be careful because if you're using brains or because you're actually working with a hide, don't get that temperature too hot. You don't want it boiling and you don't want it up near 150, 160 degrees, because you can literally cook the hide. You don't want to do that. And if you're using brains, you're gonna you're just gonna cook your brains. The the test you can make use of is if you can put your hand in there, or your fingers in there, and you're not burning yourself, but you you know it's warm enough that you can you can take it out after a little bit. It's probably about the right kind of the right temperature. So we're gonna take our mixture. We're gonna take a, our gallon of water. We're going to add to that. Uh, half to two thirds of a cup of soy lecithin, uh, one third bar grated up of ivory soap, and then a quarter cup of pure neat's foot oil, and put that in the water, let that start simmering, keep it stirring a little bit. And when it's at that temperature where you can put your hand in, it's not gonna burn you, but it feels warm enough, you're probably about ready. So let's get that mixed up and we'll get our hide in. Well, as you can see, I'm just slowly working the hide, which is it's not really as hard as rawhide, but it's still pretty stiff. I'm just slowly working it into the solution right now. No need to hurry. There we go. Beginning to feel very soft now. 
here's a here's a good spot to show you. You can kind of see right here this this is already opening up a little bit, and there's still some hard spots. So that's why when if you can really do an even job on your fleshing and thinning that hide down, get rid of a lot of those. But you're gonna have them. But we just got this in, so this is this is going to break pretty nicely. Just make sure that you've got your hide completely wet. This is just warm enough for my hands. Now I can get that somewhat unrolled. Okay, so we've got it started. Now what I'm gonna do, about every 15, 20 minutes, I like to come out and I just wanna, I like to work around these edges. And just sort of grab in about four to six inches around the edges. Just start working that. Just I just pull it. You can kind of see how as you do this, these harder, these harder areas begin to open up. I wish the camera could do a good job. You can see how it just kind of that hide kind of lightens up. But just work around your hide. And there's going to be some hard spots at first. Just work around it about every 15, 20 minutes. And as much as possible, just try and keep it submerged. And we'll let the solution do its magic. This is about my fourth time out here, and I just want to check this now. A good way to check and see if that <clears throat> if that hide is taking in that liquid is find your spot, squeeze that. Oh yeah, see those bubbles? We like bubbles. That means that solution is really getting into all of the area of that hide. All right, a couple more times, and then we're gonna be ready to take it out and soften it. Hey, thanks for watching, and if you like what we're doing with these videos, be sure and hit that like button below, and if you haven't yet, please subscribe, and leave some comments if there's some things that you'd like to see us do, areas of the fur trade you'd like to see us explore, and I'll try and get some videos made of that. Let me know. Thanks for watching.